Stand clear of the closing doors, please. Hi. Welcome to the Christmas Time in the City podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Chris. Before we get started, be sure to follow us on social media. We're Christmas Time in the City podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and our new YouTube channel. Be sure to check out our new website, christmastimeinthecity.com. That's where you'll find our show notes, videos, and our interactive maps featuring filming locations and iconic Christmas attractions throughout the city. And as always, feel free to email any questions or comments to us at christmastimeinthecitypodcast at gmail.com. Well, we're here. August. We've done it. We're in the midst of summer now, so that's fun. Sure I know is. We're closer to Christmas than we were the last time. I think, like most people, a lot of our summer plans have been kind of postponed, which is a bummer, but that's how it goes. So, mm-hmm. so since tourism is more or less canceled in the city this summer, we thought we'd take a trip down memory lane and talk a bit about some of the fun destinations from the past and present. That being said, I think there's probably only one way and only one place we could start. So let's get to it. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic, with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. The place where merriment is king. Let's mingle with one million folks. Folks who are just like all of us. 10,000 youngsters and oldsters. All swimming, playing, or resting. All getting their share of the sun and the fun. All refugees from the city heat. Here where the beach meets the cool Atlantic. Here in this great whirlpool of joy. Here for a lark at Coney Island world's biggest barrel of fun. Coney Island is where New York City began. When Henry Hudson arrived in America looking for passage to the east in 1609, his first landing was at Coney Island. There he found the Canarsie people, who used the island as a place to fish, dig for mussels and clams, and hunt for rabbits, called Coney's. From there, he sailed up New York Bay to Manhattan, and then up the river that now bears his name. After realizing the river was not his route to China, he turned around and went home to his employers, the Dutch East India Company. They came back with farmers, trappers, and merchants to colonize everything along Hudson's route. Coney Island was back in the history books in 1776, when British troops landed on the beaches there before marching to Gowanus to the Battle of Brooklyn, the first large battle of the Revolutionary War. After the war, the island retreated back to obscurity, enjoyed only by those who lived nearby. All that would change in the mid-1800s. By the 1840s, a bridge had been built joining the island to the mainland, and a hotel called Coney Island House was established. Many of America's most famous people stayed there and enjoyed the sand and surf. By 1865, Peter Tillieu had established his surf club, a restaurant, hotel, and bathing emporium. Guests could not only wine, dine, and stay overnight, they could rent bathing suits and dresses for men and women to frolic in the water. In 1877, railroad tycoon August Corbin built a huge, elegant hotel called the Manhattan Beach Hotel. It had 258 rooms, 700 feet of private ocean frontage, manicured lawns, and an expansive veranda for beachside viewing. It also had several restaurants, a ballroom, and other amenities. It was considered the most elegant hotel in the entire country. Coney Island was teeming with well-off adults. All of the amenities were initially built to cater to those with leisure time and money. The major hotels were exclusively for the rich. This didn't last long, though. Smaller hotels and hotels without beach access soon sprang up for those of lesser means. By the beginning of the 1880s, a wider road reached Coney Island. New eating and bathing establishments were founded, with beer gardens, dancing pavilions, and gaming rooms, as well as bath lockers and beachfront access. As the area became more popular, big-time hoteliers set out to make Coney Island the East Coast Riviera. Racing down Ocean Parkway on horseback soon became a sport of its own. The races began drawing crowds, which led to the opening of several racetracks. In 1886, Coney Island became the racetrack capital of the country. With easy access to the island from Manhattan, more people began day tripping. In 1884, the first ride, a proto roller coaster called the Switchback Railroad, opened. It was a big hit and the beginning of Coney Island's age of amusement. The first Coney Island amusement park was called Sea Lion Park, and it opened in 1895. Soon after, the first Shoot the Shoots ride, soon to be a staple of every Coney Island amusement park, opened. It was a flat-bottomed boat that traveled down a steep, watery incline with bumps that made the boat bounce riders up in their seats and splash them with water. When the boat got to the bottom, it was steered to a track that hauled the boat to the top to repeat the trip. In spite of its successes, Sea Lion Park closed in 1902. 
Shortly after, George Tillieu leased some Coney Island land, bought a small Ferris wheel, lied, and called it the largest one in the world, mm -hmm. and opened for business. It was lit by thousands of incandescent lights and was an instant sellout. He followed that up by leasing a large piece of land around the wheel, creating Coney Island's first large gated amusement park, Steeplechase Park. Steeplechase was named for his iconic horse racing ride. Patrons rode metal horses that traveled along a long track that traversed the park, complete with dips and hills. Till you charge 25 cents to enter. Guests could ride all the rides and visit all the attractions for that admission. As it grew, he added more and more attractions. Steeplechase Park's logo was a huge smiling face called Tilly. He promised fun, some of it naughty, but harmless, as well as thrills and chills. The park was soon joined by two other large parks, as well as countless small game operators. Luna Park opened in 1903 on the site of the old Sea Lion Park. They kept the old park shoot the shoots and added other attractions. Dreamland opened soon after in 1904. It too had a shoot the shoots ride and a tall, electrically built observation tower. By the time Dreamland opened, the rich people had left Coney Island for Long Island and upstate. The horse racing tracks had closed, and the huge resort hotels either shuttered or burned down. In the early 20th century, the island was connected to the mainland with landfill. Coney Island was now the popular everyman's playland, available for the five cent price of a subway ticket. Fire was a huge hazard in Coney Island. Both of the area's red light districts burned down. Steeplechase Park burned down in 1907, but was immediately rebuilt. Dreamland burned down in 1911. Luna Park burned down in 1946. Jeez. When it... <laughs> the owners of the two parks charged admission to look at the ruins. That's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> it's well, just gotta like, make, you gotta make money. I guess so. I mean, if you know things are just gonna keep burning down, might as well try to get some money to rebuild, right? I guess. By the beginning of the 1960s, there wasn't much left of old Coney Island. They eventually built Keyspan Park Ballfield, which is now called the MCU Park, on the land that once held the Steeplechase Park. Yeah, that's where the Brooklyn Cyclones play. Yeah. We've been there a few times. Yeah, it's a fun little little outing for sure. Dreamland's plot is now home to the New York Aquarium. The original Luna Park land is now a high-rise apartment complex, still called Luna Park. Astroland, an amusement park established in 1962 as a futuristic theme park, was the last of the Coney Island parks. It was the home of the Cyclone, Coney Island's famous roller coaster, a ride that had outlived just about everything. The Fort Amphitheater opened on the boardwalk in 2016. The boardwalk was landmarked in 2018. Every year, on January 1st, a brave group of adventurous swimmers convene on the Coney Island Boardwalk at Stillwell Avenue to help welcome the new year as part of the Coney Island Polar Bears Club annual holiday dip. Founded in 1903, the Coney Island Polar Bear Club is the oldest winter bathing organization in the country. Its seasoned members enjoy swimming in the Atlantic Ocean every Sunday from November to April, but the New Year's Day swim is open to anyone willing to brave the sometimes brutal temperatures in the name of tradition and charity. There's a small suggested donation to benefit several local Coney Island organizations. The most recent New Year's Day swim was on a frosty 37 degree day, and its waters an even icier 17 degrees. Alright, so this is my announcement, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be swimming with the polar bears this year, come January 1st. Yes. I'm going to be doing the dip with uh, a lot of people. I imagine we'll be distanced, but regardless... I'll be there January 1st, jumping in the frigid temperatures. Oh, Hopefully man. in a Santa outfit. <laughs> in a, well, yeah, in a Santa outfit as well. I'm, my Originally, my idea was to put like a wetsuit on underneath the Santa outfit, somehow remain sort of warm. But I don't, I can't, I'm not going to buy a wetsuit. That's crazy. So I'm just going to buy a Santa outfit and just... Just brave it. You know, that's the, the whole idea, right? Yeah, so just I'm going to do it. it. So there'll be more information about that later, but expect to see video, I would imagine, of that. And we'll probably talk about it when... It comes a little closer. But that's it. So fun. Coney Island. Coney Island's a fun place. We've been there a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm, I really like it. I'm looking forward to going back. Yeah, there's a lot to do there. Yeah. There's all, I mean, so many different things tucked into corners, you know. It, it's definitely an all-day adventure going there. So I know they're probably taking a hit by being closed this summer, which is a bummer. So I hope everyone comes out, you know, when things are safe to kind of help rebuild and, and make sure it maintains and stays there for a lot longer. Yeah. And no more fires. Jeez. No more fires. <laughs> wow, right? Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm glad that's not there. I like the idea of them just like having to like just shoveling all this like burnt up wood. I'm like, all right, bring the new wood in. Mm -hmm, <laughs> just mm -hmm. 
Let's, let's make a new boardwalk. <laughs> All right. So that's Coney Island. Let's get to some news. How about that? It's time for the news. All right. So the first thing, not a very positive first article, but we all knew it was coming. The Rockettes Christmas Spectacular is officially canceled. So, you know, this is the first time in 87 years that the show at Radio City Music Hall won't go on. So that's pretty, pretty sad. And it seems like a lot of the dancers are pretty upset. But again, everyone knew it was coming. Broadway's closed until next year. So it was only a matter of time before this also closed. Yeah. But, you know, I guess hearing it official kind of makes it real. Yeah. I think we'll probably start hearing a lot more announcements like this, which is sad. But I think that's going to be kind of the norm this year. So hopefully it's not out of control and... There's still some sort of Christmas. Well, let's move on to our next article. Oh, because I let's, think let's move on to our next article. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really have to do with Christmas, but it's a thing that you could do around Christmas. But it's a, something that's open. So, you know, it's unfortunately it's canceled and closed. But the Rockefeller Center, top of the rock, is now open. The observation deck. It opened on Thursday, August 6th. So they have, I think the hours are yeah 1 to 9 p.m. Seven days a week. So they're open every day. It's a shorter hours, but you can still get great views up there. You can still see the sunset. I mean, I think this is something that's going to encourage people to have a little bit of light in their tourism. And they were doing, as part of a limited time offer, all essential workers were getting in for free and having a free guest ticket as well. This was last weekend. So it's over now. Sorry. But I thought that was really cool that they did that. And they offered them free ice cream and stuff to say their thanks. Cool. But it's now open. Something is happening. I would say that that's probably one of the better observation decks in New York City as well. A lot of people think that the Empire State Building is a better view, but you really get a better view of the Empire State Building and also everything else from the top of the rock. So Yeah, you get to see everything. So in the article, it even says, where is it? Nowhere in New York City more inspiring than from the 70th floor, where you feel like you can touch Central Park and the entire city beyond, from Yankee Stadium to the Statue of Liberty, from Flushing Meadows all the way to New Jersey. So, yeah, I thought that was a cool way to put it. It's definitely a great view of everything. And then you get to see the Empire State Building. So when you're on there, you'll get to see how cool it looks. That's true. So that's a really good thing. Cool. Um, But, yeah. That's fun. Yay, something's open. Great, something's open. All right, so let's get into some listener mail. You've got listener mail. All right, here we go. This one's from a good friend of the show, Casey Carroll. He says, how do you both deal with living so far from your families? My wife and I are about to be living 35 hours away from our families for the first time. And the fam is not taking it too well. Oh, yeah, that's tough. I think what helped was gradually moving. I think that we did a big jump. I think we did a big jump too quick. (laughs) Not too quick, but where it was still really difficult. But we moved away from the base of our family for like eight years, which was still only a few hours away from them before we made the big jump so Mm -hmm. i think that helped but it's definitely really hard you know it's i don't know how we deal with it i guess we just we know where we came from where we were living wasn't really meant for us so yes we miss them and yes i still really want to be around them you know and i still deal with it on a day-to-day basis but i also don't want to live there you know i really enjoy living where i live being around you know the New York City, obviously, is magical, so being here is really important. And just being in the North, I really love being in the North. Yeah. Seeing seasons, all these things I didn't experience as a young person. Everybody, she loves seasons. Sorry, I'll probably mention it She talks about it all the time. Yeah, pretty much. Well, when you don't grow up with any seasons besides summer, it's a pretty big deal. But yeah, so we still deal with it, but you find what's making it worth it. I thought it was interesting that he, he said 35 hours away. I feel like that's probably the, not the greatest perspective on mm. the distance. I would imagine you probably would be flying if you were going to head back for any reason, which I'm sure wouldn't be a 35-hour flight. So I, I think if you look at it in smaller chunks of time, it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Yeah. I, I would what's it, like a four-hour flight probably? It's most flights are about four hours as long as they're not like cross-country. So. Yeah, it makes the time that you have with yeah. them even more special. Because I, know, I think we, we live around 25 yeah, we live about 25 hours. 20, I mean, who knows? We usually go real slow. Yeah, we're pretty far from from home, but it's just a, a day trip. It's also an idea that we've been kind of uh, tossing around with our families, especially now that we have a kid. And we don't necessarily want to like go back to places we've already been to. So now we're trying to do things where we're meeting up and 
middle places, like we're maybe meet, meeting up in like Gatlinburg or somewhere in Tennessee or somewhere in North Carolina or, or having some having them come out to us and going upstate more, or going to Vermont, and just doing other things as opposed to like going to visit your family somewhere. You can go on a vacation with your family. So you're not just going back and seeing where the new Chipotle is. You're, you're going <laughs> and seeing like fun things and uh, Chipotle in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Vermont has Chipotle. So I feel like there's Do you think no they charge extra there. for guacamole if the Chipotle is in Vermont? <laughs> yeah, Probably. I'm assuming. <laughs> but it's but everything just smells like maple syrup. I imagine. Mm -hmm. Is that offensive to Vermontians? I don't find that offensive at all. I would. Yeah, we, yeah. I like maple <laughs> syrup. That's a good point. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you still deal and you make it work. I think that's it. You just do what's best for you and your family, and you make it work with your other half of your family. Yeah. You're, you're starting a new chapter, which is very awesome. So congratulations to both of you. Yeah, it's a very and exciting time. Yeah, if you have any questions later on, feel free to reach out to us. Even if it's privately, we're more than happy to give you some advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here we go. The moment you've been waiting for. We've got some more Christmas Confidential. Ooh. I'm really feeling the intro. I like that intro very much, actually. <laughs> I think I might just only have intros to like segments that I'm never going to actually... <laughs> I'll just make intros for other people's segments. There you go. Just force them to use these things. <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple of Christmas confidentials. Basically, what we've been doing is we've been uh, asking people on social media and on the podcast to submit anonymously things they want to get off their chest in regards to Christmas, and we will talk about it a little bit. Like I said, it's all anonymous, so feel free. If you want to, reach out to us on social media or email us at christmastimeinthecitypodcast at gmail.com, and we will most likely get to it unless it's like something like a Christmas murder or something. I don't oh, know. Oh, gosh. I hope not. Don't, don't confess that <laughs> Don't to confess us, that because that's... <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. Please don't man. confess that. Yeah, that's, that's too much right to person. deal with right now. <laughs> 2020 has been weird enough. Yeah, exactly. All right, so here's one. I hate that at my in-laws, they expect the adults to open their gifts at the same time. And it's all the gifts. You're too busy opening your gift to see the reaction of the gifts that you got them. I I agree with that person. You know, I mean, I'm not one like, you don't have to take your time and everyone stare at one person. And I mean, because I feel like eventually you start to get a rhythm and you start to open up because it's like, mm -hmm. all right, we got to get this thing going because it's going to take all day. Yeah. Uh, but definitely starting out and then there are certain gifts that you want to make sure like, oh, wait, open that when I'm watching you or you know you kind of are more involved that way but yeah, yeah for everyone to just like dig in and go crazy i wonder know? if this person is doing it's opening their gifts with the in-laws on christmas morning or like christmas eve or something mm. so i i can almost like see it being okay on christmas eve but christmas morning seems like a different beast altogether so i'm not even sure i want to do that but christmas eve who cares you know yeah i don't know i don't know either. it's a bummer still i mean like if if you got someone something special and then they open it and you're like, oh, did you get that thing? Yeah. What thing? Oh, you didn't open it yet, and you just gave away your gift. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it, man. Yeah, I agree. That's, That's a bummer. A... Sorry about that. I mean, my suggestion, you know, ask them. Leave her. No. It's a... <laughs> Leave her. That's Leave her. Um, don't turn back. No. Uh, I would su uh, make a suggestion, you know, say, hey, why don't we all take turns this year? Or, hey, why don't we have the kids go first this year? I'd really love to see their reactions, you know? Just be upfront and straight about it why not you know what's the worst that could happen yeah they say no and then you all open it once all right whatever and then it's awkward for the rest of the afternoon it's yeah like, we're just like i can't believe you want to open it's not presents. awkward i think it's okay to be assertive <laughs> and ask for or make suggestions for things that you think would be nice that's true okay so here's the next one do you want to read the next one sure like many kids, I would sneak out of my room in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve and check out what Santa put in my stocking. Sometimes if it looked like my brother got better candy in his stocking than I did, I would put some of his candy in my stocking. But I'm pretty sure he was doing the same thing, so it's fine, right? Now I feel like an awful person. I'm not sure confession was good for the soul. I guess the redemption here is that there was one year I really wanted a toy that he had in his stocking, but I managed to resist swapping it out. I was pretty sure Santa would see that one. I feel like that's really cute. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun story. Yeah. That's a... I mean, I don't think I ever snuck out and actually touched anything that Santa brought me or anything, you know, before the people were out. But I don't know. I mean, your kids, it's cute, you yeah. know? And at least you're swapping it out and not just stealing it from and the it's stocking. And it's stocking stuff, so it's 
stocking it's stuffers. candy yeah. you know they'll probably trade candy anyway so might as well just get it done before maybe yeah. a harmonica or something yeah maybe santa didn't know that that was a candy you preferred over your brother that probably felt good to get off his chest i wonder if he actually has told anyone that before he or she i don't want to gender identify anyone yeah but that's a pretty good one yeah i hope that person really feels cute. better and i thank them for sharing with us yeah and i don't think it's a big deal so i don't think it is either who cares it's just you kids did great <laughs> kids get off with anything trust me if i've learned anything over this time in the house with our baby is that he gets away with basically anything yeah he's pretty cute that's how it goes I that's guess. all you need all right so that being said that looks like it's it for this episode this podcast is recorded like always in our apartment in the big apple in new york city if you like this podcast do us a favor and take a minute to rate it and write a review contact us and let us know you did we'll send you some stickers including our new home alone 2 theme Christmas time in the city sticker, which we just got in today. So you'll be getting four stickers in this sticker pack and a thank you note. So please. For free. For free. So write a, write a review, recommend it on Facebook. It helps people find the podcast, especially now that we're coming into the Burr months. We want people to be able to find the podcast. So help us out. Subscribe now and follow us on social media so we can keep the conversation going and keep you posted about new episodes. Until next time, I'm Chris. And I'm Chris. And this is Christmas time in the city. With bumps that made the boat bounce. With bumps that made the bounce. <laughs> <laughs> bounce.